Well, it's good being with you. Uh, last week, my business partner, Dan Cook, was here with you, and it's a great privilege to be able to journey with you. I believe we were here about six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, somewhere. I was teaching a biblical entrepreneurship class for those of you here at Venture, and uh, God has you on an amazing journey, and it's exciting to be part of that journey with you. And uh, I, I wanted this to kind of share a few things from my own personal journey as a pastor of 29 years in uh, a message this morning called The Dash. I heard a story of a couple that were celebrating their 60th birthday together, and uh, in celebration of their 60th birthdays, a genie showed up and said that he would grant them each one wish. And the wife turned to the genie and said, I know what my wish is. I wish to travel with my husband all over the world, and poof, the genie granted her wish, and she had in her hands tickets to all sorts of destinations all over the world, and she was so excited. And then the, journey, uh, the genie turned to the husband and said, now it's your, your wish. What is, what is your wish? 60 years old, what is your wish? And he bowed his head a little bit, looked at his wife, and said, well, I really wish I could be married to a woman who was 30 years younger. And the genie went, poof, and he was immediately 90 years old. It just says you got to be careful what you wish for. You know, this life is the dash. And if you've ever been to a cemetery, you've seen the tombstones. And on those tombstones, it usually is the, the, uh, the life saying of a person. But there's something that is common on all tombstones. That is the date in which we were born, which all of us here know, and the date at which we die. And the reality is you and I don't know what tomorrow holds, and our entire life is summed up in between by a dash. And in looking at eternity, we realize that life is indeed extremely short. About two weeks ago, I sat in Montana at the funeral of a 27-year-old girl who tragically passed away. Uh, she had been married just two years. Her husband serves on my staff. And I was sitting in this funeral, and I was thinking to myself, man, you just never know. She was 27 years old, went in for a procedure, very minor procedure at the doctor's office, came home, was eating dinner, turned to her husband and said, I just don't feel right. I don't feel like I can breathe. They called 911, and by the time she had gotten to the hospital, she had died. And, and no one knows really why it's so odd, so, so unexpected. And it just reminds us that in this life, it is extremely short, and you just don't know what tomorrow holds. So the reality is, are we plumbing everything that we can get from this journey? Uh, John Wesley, a great theologian, said these words. He says, I judge all things only by the price that they shall gain in eternity. In other words, he said, I'm looking at the here and now. I'm judging at the here and now. What's, what's going to take place? What's going to transpire for eternity? I want to make my life count in the here and now. Uh, that great theologian John Lennon <laughs> said these words. He's not a theologian, by the way. He said, uh, life happens while we are busy making plans. Isn't that true, that you're moving along and you've got certain things planned and it just doesn't always work out the way you kind of wished it would work out? Life has a different way of leading us on different journeys. David said it this way in Psalm. He said, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. He said, remind me that my days, they're what? They're numbered and that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is but a breath. And David was just reminded that today you have it and tomorrow you don't. And the reality is you're just not sure what is going to happen tomorrow. So the question is, how are you spending that dash? Uh, Linda Ellis wrote a poem called The Dash, and I'd like to read that poem to you. She says this in her poem, I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we live and love, and how it matters not, for it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love, 
and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things that you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before, if we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? You're in a series called All In. And in this series, you've been talking through the book of Nehemiah about how Nehemiah accomplished an amazing task of, of building the walls of Jerusalem, and he called the people together, and it wasn't something that just Nehemiah did on his own. It was the fact that he had rallied a group of people and resources together, and they did something incredible. They built the walls of Jerusalem, something that people said could not be done, and it was accomplished. As we get to the end of the rebuilding of the walls when they were completely finished, Nehemiah records this of those uh, walls that were built. So on the 2nd of October, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. 52 days they built the walls. And then he goes on to say, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized that this work had been done, can you say this with me, with the help of of our God. Can you say that again? With the help of our God. The reality is, Venture Church, you're starting on a journey right now that's an amazing journey. It's an audacious journey. It's a journey that people around you are going, are you crazy? Are you nuts? You're going to build a hotel and a daycare center and an event center. You're going to be open 365 days a year, seven days a week, and you're going to invite people in. This is a dream that only God can do. Venture Church, you have just a few days to raise $950,000. If God does not help you, your journey will not be complete. We need God. I am reminded of a God that, that looks down upon us, not based on the size of our army, not based upon the size of our bank account, but it's a God that we look up at and go, man, we serve a great God. This is a God that wants to do great and mighty things among us. And I stand as evidence of a God that wants to do great things among us. I had pastored 14 years in Seattle, Washington, a church called New Life. When I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm tired of just simply trading sheep. And that's what we were doing in Seattle is some people from one church would move over to another church just simply because it was the greatest and the best thing that was taking place in Seattle. And I told my wife, I really do want to reach people who have yet to hear the message, the good news that Jesus has come to, to seek and to save that which is lost. He's come to make a difference in marriages and lives. And I told her, I said, let's, let's move to Portland, Oregon, and let's just start a church. And, and to my amazement, she said she was with me. And so I was so thankful as we, we went to Portland, Oregon, and we started gathering a few people together. I resigned from my church, uh, let go of the paycheck, and just made the jump, just said, let's go start a church. I've never started a church before, but what do we have to lose? And so we went to Portland, Oregon. Uh, gathered a few people together. By the time we hit about 25, 30 people, I realized what we had to lose was I was going to starve to death. And so I realized, uh-oh, I'm going to have to go get a job. So for the first time in my life, I had to be bivocational, and I got a job with a hospitality management company. One of the guys in my church owned a hospitality management company, and he invited me to be part of it. Started buying and selling hotels and, and realizing that my business partners had a lot of money, and they were buying homes and cars, and, and, and there was not a lack of money in these hotels. And we were renting to churches, and churches were renting our space, and there was absolutely no impact on our guests. And we were taking the church's money, and then we were putting it in the pockets of our investors, and our investors were buying cars and nice vacations and all this. And I was noticing on the news that we were closing shelters and recovery programs, and churches were closing their doors. And, and I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. The church really should have the money. And what would happen if the church actually owned the hotel? So I went to our hotel broker, 
uh, Bob Burkett at the time and asked Bob, I said, Bob, you know, you've been helping us buy and sell hotels for a while now. I'm kind of new to this game, brand new to Portland. Got a church of 50 people. Bob, I want to go buy a hotel with 50 people, and, and I want to I see lost people come to know who Jesus is. And he said, Eric, you're not from here, are you? And I said, no. And he said, I have the perfect place for you. He said, it just needs a little work. Anytime you hear those words, it's going to need a little work, run. He said, uh, have you ever heard of the hotel called the Pink Flamingo? That should have been my first clue. When somebody wants to sell you a hotel called the Pink Flamingo, you know that you're in trouble. And I said, no, I, I've never heard of it. He said, well, it's in a great location right on the freeway, right by the airport. He said, like I said, it just needs a little work. Why don't we go up there and take a look at it? And I looked at it, and all I could see was possibilities. I'm a dreamer. So I stand on the edge of a tomorrow, and all I can see is a bright new horizon. I don't see the work. I just see where we're going. And so I saw all these buildings. I saw a bar, and I thought, man, that could be a children's center. I saw a conference center, and I thought, that could be a worship center. I saw hotels, 164 hotels, and I thought, man, these hotels could be turned into a place where, where people could discover who Jesus is, and guests could come in, and we could interact with him. And all I saw was possibilities. And Bob said, do you have any money? And I said, no, Bob, we're a church of 50 people. We don't have any money. And Bob said, that should work. That should have been my second clue right there. Uh, this was 2003. So um, I stood in front of the congregation on a Sunday morning and said to the congregation, we're going to take up an offering. Uh, we've got to all be in on this. And, and we took up an offering of $7,000. And with $7,000 in June of 2003, we went and bought $3.1 million worth of property, talked the bank into giving us a loan. Back in 2003, you could do that. You couldn't do that today because banks back then were just giving money away. Uh, today, the lending has completely changed. But back then, we could talk a bank into doing it. And with our denominational support, we sold them on the idea. And before we knew it, we moved into an old, dilapidated travel lodge hotel that was soon going to become our church. And uh, we were so excited. Little did we know what we had bought. Uh, the Portland Police Department was coming every night when they needed to make their arrest quota. They just simply came to our hotel, knocked on the doors, and housekeeping the next morning was amazing because all of our guests were usually gone by about 4 o'clock in the morning. And so because they were arrested, they were in jail. I mean, and uh, we had an arrest every single day, and we had problems every day. And in the middle of this, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world did we buy? I mean, we had prostitutes turning tricks in our rooms, and we had drug deals happening, and we had all kinds of things going on. And one day, I'm dealing with uh, some of these issues with the police officer that came on property, and we had dealt with a couple of issues, and then one of the housekeepers said, you might want to come over here and take a look. And we went into a guest room, and in that guest room was passports and checks and printers and here we had been running an identity theft ring for about a week and we didn't realize that, you know, our church had been operating an identity theft ring in our buildings. And so we dealt with that and then we're kind of walking out and police officer, he, he looks at me and he goes, so, hey, he said, I, I heard a rumor that a church bought this place. <laughs> and I laughed. And I said, oh, no, that's not a rumor. That's true. A church did buy this place. And then he looks at me and he goes, I just don't know which pastor would be stupid enough to lead his congregation into buying this. Didn't that pastor know that this is the biggest distribution center for methamphetamines in the entire city of Portland, Oregon? And uh, he said, and it's a prostitution house. What church would buy a prostitution house? And we get to his patrol car and he looks at me and he says, so what do you do here? I was so tempted to say, I'm the maintenance guy. But I knew that he wasn't going to buy that for anything and so... I reached out my hand and shook his hand and said, well, I guess you might just call me the senior pastor of the biggest crack house in all of Portland. He looked at me and he said, you got guts. It was that conversation that changed my thinking because I realized we were on to something. He said, if I were to ever attend a church, he said, I've never been to church my whole life. He said, but if I were to ever attend a church, this is the church that I would attend because he said, you're doing something that nobody else has done. And he said, you've got guts. What can I do to help? And the Portland Police Department came and they began to make arrests and then we began to remodel those to ho that hotel. And pretty soon we had remodeled those hotels. It took us about uh, almost a year. And we remodeled the 164 rooms and we opened up a brand new Quality Inn and Suites. And out of 832 Quality Inns and Suites, we were the number one in the franchise. 
We opened up a second hotel right there on site as well. So we had two hotels, a roadway, and we were the number one roadway in worldwide in the Choice Hotel system. And God's hotel was up and running. It was amazing to watch our church grow from one service to two, from two services to three, from three services to four, from four services to five. And finally we said, we've got to stop with the services. We, we've got too many people coming in. And, and, and it was wild. It was crazy. We had people coming in off the streets. We had homeless people coming in, people with money coming in. We had people that wanted to make a difference because, see, now all of a sudden all of our offerings were going for ministry and none of our offerings were going to pay the utilities and the electricity and all that because the business was there to generate the income for sustainability processes and we were turning something around and it was taking a while and, and we, we had prostitutes and, and, and drug addicts come into church and they'd shoot up heroin in the parking lot and then come into the service. It was kind of maybe the only way they could get through church and it was wild and I loved it. And then we started planting churches. We planted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven churches. We had a 10,000 square foot feeding program right down the, the road and we fed people out of that warehouse and we opened the largest family shelter today in America that doesn't receive government support called My Father's House. Uh, we had a job training program called People's Work. We had a counseling center. We were birthing a new major ministry every single month and God was just doing amazing things. But more than all of that was the lives that were being touched. We operated the hotel from 2002 to 2010, and during that time period, we saw more than 3,500 people come to the hotel thinking that they were getting a quality inn and suites room for the night. They would interact with us as the church, and they would leave the next day discovering who Jesus was and finding a new life in Him. And to this day, I get letters from all over the world of people saying, I made my first time commitment there at your hotel. Thank God you were running that hotel. It was like the woman who got dropped off by a taxi cab driver at our, at our hotel because she didn't have a room for the night. And uh, when she got into the hotel, she comes to the front desk. She was obviously distraught. Our children's pastor is working the front desk, and he turns to her and he says, Ma'am, I, I normally don't say this, but, but you just need to know that God loves you. And she breaks down. She starts crying right there on the spot. And, and he goes, it, it's okay. He said, I know this looks like a hotel, but it's really not a hotel. He said, really, this is a church. And, and she was so confused. And she said, he said, I'm, I'm the children's pastor. And she's crying. And she says, I, I thought I was checking into a hotel. And he said, you are, but our church owns the hotel. And, and we just want you to know that we love you. And she's still confused. And he said, it's, it's okay. Uh, when you get to your room, if you want to talk to a pastor... Just press zero. I don't know how many hotels that you can go to and press zero and talk to a pastor, but at our hotel you could do so. And she got to her room and she just wondered, would this work? And she dialed zero and said, I'd like to talk to a pastor. And we sent two female pastors to her room. And she began to share with them that she had been flying into Portland, Oregon for seven years having an affair on her husband. And that morning when she landed at PDX Airport, she realized that what she had been doing was wrong, and she felt an overwhelming sense of guilt. And she said, of all places, the taxi cab drive dro drops me off at. He drops me off at a church. He said, I used to, I, she said, I used to attend church, but no longer have. And, and uh, she said, I've just done too much. And these pastors shared with her the good news that no matter what you've been, no matter what, what you've done, no matter what uh, circumstances you find yourself in, there is a God who is always there waiting to forgive you, whose arms are open wide, and you can come back home at any point in time. And she recommitted her life to Christ, called her, her lover up and said, we are done with this relationship. And the next day, she flew back to Florida uh, to be with her husband and her children. And a year and a half later, she sent me a letter. And the letter just read, Dear Pastor Eric, I just want to thank you that your church was operating a hotel. And because your church was operating a hotel, I was able to now get my life straight. My husband and I have a great marriage. Our kids are doing fantastic. We found a life-giving church that we're plugged into here in Florida. And she said, I just want to thank you because you were there for me. 
And I could stand up here today and I could share with you story after story after story of of people who who wrote us and said, man, you made a difference in my life because you were there 365 days a year. You never closed the door. We had people at 2 o'clock in the morning coming into the lobby saying, man, we hear this is the place to to find out about who Jesus is. And and our night audit would be praying with them to receive Christ. And I'd come in the next day and they'd say, we want to introduce you to somebody who just received Christ. And, And our church just exploded because... We were just known as a place where you could journey safely. The city of Portland sent us a letter six months after we had been there and said, we just want to thank the church. The church has done in six months what the city could not do in 10 years. Crime dropped in our neighborhood. Prostitution dropped in our neighborhood. Drug addiction dropped in our neighborhood. Crime was reduced because the church was in the neighborhood. And when the church is in the neighborhood and the church looks different, it makes a difference in the city. And when the righteous begin to prosper, Scripture says that the city rejoices. And our city was rejoicing because of the good things that we were doing in Portland, Oregon. We operated that ministry from 2002 to 2010 touching the lives literally of thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and I could share story after story after story with you. It was one week after Easter in 2010, I was on my way to a hotel convention, and the phone rang, my cell phone rang, and on the other end was our general manager, and he said, you've got to turn around, Pastor Eric, our hotel's on fire. I immediately looked on Facebook and started seeing the the news feeds coming in and uh, realized that this was not just a little fire, it was a three alarm fire. And by the time I got back at four o'clock in the morning and pulled into the parking lot, my wife came out to meet me. We had the FBI there and, and uh, uh, all kinds of fire people and police departments and they were uh, just inspecting the whole place. And, and she came out and she hugged me in the parking lot and the entire ministry center, everything that we had built was completely destroyed. Um, I can't begin to tell you the pain that that fire created in my life, all the hard work, all the people that had been touched, and uh, it, it was the most painful moment of my adult life and career. Uh, our denomination was in the midst of recession. Over 50% of our denomination and all churches could not pay their mortgage. Um, Bank of America had canceled the denomination's credit line. We were all on one balance sheet, so therefore we did not own the property. And, and the denomination made the decision to sell our property, and so we would not be able to rebuild. I was so angry with God. Um, we had learned so much. We had seen so much happen. Uh, we're, our church started wandering then. It, we looked at 70 different buildings, and we couldn't find a place to meet. And finally landed in a gymnasium somewhere, and then I, I was just simply too tired to go on. Um, I was suicidal, Um, I was an absolute mess, and I thought maybe God was done with me. We merged our church in with another church there in Portland, Oregon, a a mega church there in Portland, a great church, New Beginnings, and Pastor Brad, a great friend of mine, just said, come on in and rest, and you become one of the teaching pastors here at at, uh, Anthem, and and just merge your church in, and, and I just rested for a little bit. It was there that I met Dan Cook and Building God's Way, and Dan invited me to, as he said last week, do something really important with my life. And he said, why don't you join our team and let's go across the United States and let's take what you've learned and let's now help other churches do the same thing. And, and I, I, I was excited to join with him. About the same time in 2012, January 1st, 2012, my telephone rings and on the other end is a guy who read a copy of my book. He had a copy of my book in Kalispell, Montana. And his name was Scott, and Scott said, hey, I've got a copy of your book here. And I said, I wondered where that copy went to. He said, well, it's, it's here in Montana. And it was the story of our church. I had published it in October of 2009. In April of 2010, the church burns. My wife said, what are we going to do with all these books? I said, I don't know. One of the copies made its way to Montana. Scott, on the other end, said, hey, uh, we want we to do a hotel here. We want to do the same thing. Church is a prayer center. We want to do sustainability here. And we've got this great hotel, a Best Western Hotel. And he said, I, I think we could do that. And first words out of my mouth, I looked at the hotel and said, oh, it's, it's a really nice hotel. And then I said to Scott, do you have any money? And Scott says, no, we don't have any money, but you wrote in your book that we didn't need any money. And I said, man, I really wished I would not have written that. 
He said, you said all we need is God. I said, yeah, but money helps. <laughs> he said, well, you know, he said, I think we could get a pretty good deal here. It's, it's owned by a Mormon, and I think he would like to see a, a great evangelical church here in the Kalispell Valley and a great ministry happen. And I said, so a Mormon would, would like to see a ministry like what we want to do? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, this just might be God. So I met with Kenneth, a, a great man, and met him and said to Kenneth, hey, how much would you like for your hotel? And I knew his hotel was valued at $3 million. And Kenneth told me that he'd sell me the hotel for $2.1 million. Kind of sounds like uh, maybe a piece of land that Venture Church might get. You know, there might be some equity there in that place. And so we had about $900,000 of equity, a million dollars worth of equity. And, and I love having equity when I go into a business deal. That's always good to have money going in. And, you know, right there, I thought that was our miracle. And I said, man, thank you, Kenneth. That, that's amazing. What a great miracle. And I, I said, I heard you might be willing to make a charitable contribution. And he said, yeah. He said, I'd, I'd make a charitable contribution. I said, what were you kind of thinking? And then he said this, how about I write you a $1.1 million check? I said, come again? He said, I'll write you a $1.1 million check to buy my $2.1 million hotel. Have you ever heard the expression, if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true? So I knew this had to be sitting on an Indian burial ground. I just knew it. I knew there was something wrong here, you know, that he just wanted to dump this thing off on us. And so we started doing our due diligence and crawling around, and we just discovered that, no, this was, this was a miracle of God. It's too good to be true unless God's in it. And on September 2012, we closed uh, on the Best Western Kalispell Hotel, and today we have three ministries that are meeting there in that hotel. Uh, we're getting to, ready to partnership with uh, another ministry, another national ministry over there for sustainability and some more things that we're doing. And last year, or the year before actually, we wrote a $700,000 check and gave $700,000 away to foreign missions. And every year, that is a sustainable ministry that we are able to give the, monies, the monies away because God brought something into our hands that we would have never had before. I stand before you today as one who has been through the fire literally. I have learned a lot in this process. I've pastored 29 years and I knew that when that fire happened, that the devil really was wanting to take things away from me. But you know what the scripture says? That uh, God restores the years that the locusts have eaten. And I am so thankful for that fire. Because had that fire not happened, I would not be standing here in front of you this morning speaking to you. I would not be in Picayune, Mississippi, helping another church do the very same thing. I would not be in Ashland, Ohio, helping another church do the very same thing. And today we are starting to see a sustainable movement move across the United States where if we could win 3,500 people to know Jesus in Portland, Oregon, and Venture Church could win 3,500 people, and Picayune, Mississippi could win 3,500 people, and Ashland, Ohio could win 3,500 people, one day we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people because we were willing to take a risk and we were willing to do something that was unusual and out of the box that we might reach people for Jesus. We were willing to have churches that were open seven days a week, 365 days a year, and we never closed our doors. So I stand before you extremely thankful. You stand right now at the start of your miracle. And I remember when we stood at the start of our miracle, I love the beginning stages because the beginning stages are messy and they're wild and they're crazy and, and we just don't know the future. You don't know if it's going to come in. You don't, know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you can get it built. But you do know this. You know that you have a God that is leading you and where God leads, God provides. And so as we begin to kind of wrap up here, I want to share three lessons that I think are critical lessons for those of you here at Venture to keep in mind. Three lessons that I keep in mind. Three lessons of 29 years of doing this that I want to bring to your attention right now. Uh, the first lesson is this. The dash is short, so the time is now. Can you say that with me? The dash is short, 
So the time is now. The time is not tomorrow. The time is exactly right now. You can't wait. You, we've got to all be in at this moment. God is saying, I, I'm about ready to do something amazing among your midst. And, and, and it's a now moment. It's not a tomorrow moment. It's a now moment. In Nehemiah, as they were getting ready to build the walls, Nehemiah stood before God and he said this in Nehemiah 1 verse 11. He said, oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. And then he said, please grant me success. Say it with me now. He didn't say grant me success tomorrow. He said grant me success now. See, your success is a now success and it's a dependent success upon a God that has all the resources at his disposal for what he wants to do among your midst. It's not how good we are in business. It's how great our God is among us. And right now he's leading you in a now moment. The very first thing that I think we under, need to understand is that the dash is short. You just don't know how much longer you're going to have left, how much longer I'm going to have left. And this is a now moment. Uh, the second lesson that I want to point out is this, is the dash isn't easy, but the reward is great. <laughs> if you think you're going to go get land up and you're going to go build a daycare center and a hotel center and an event center, and you're not going to have work, I am here to tell you, you are wrong. But Venture Church, you're not afraid of hard work already. I walked around. You've been setting up for 15 years. So it's time to have a home. But there will be work in this process. There will be tears in this process. There will be moments when you think, did we do the right thing? Did we bite off more than we can chew? This is way bigger than we thought we could accomplish. I would rather risk something great and fail than risk nothing at all and stay the same. But in the course of risking, I would love to see a God that moves among us. See, the dash isn't easy. Life isn't easy but there is a great reward. I think the greater the risk, generally the greater the reward. And you're embarking out upon a, a, a huge risk-taking adventure. In Nehemiah, as they were moving this process forward in Nehemiah 4, 6, when the walls were about completed to half its height, it says at last the wall was completed to half its original height around the entire city. For the people had what? They had worked very hard. And when your project is done, like those like us at Eastside, when I pulled in and realized that it had been gone, we had worked so hard. We had put prayer into this and love into this and walked around it. And my kids had pulled in rock and we had cleaned rooms and we had worked front desk and we had put so much energy and so much love and so much hard work. And the moment that fire happened, it was like everything was taken out of me because we had worked so diligently hard. So the second lesson is that it comes with hard work. And the third and final lesson that I want to share with you this is the dash is a story. So Venture, will you make yours a bestseller? This is a story, and it's time for Venture to write a bestseller because God's already created your story. Mother Teresa said, I can't do what you can do, and you can't do what I can do, but together we can do great things. And it's important in this process that we, that we be able to write this phenomenal story about what God is doing because we want to be able to tell the story not just to our children, but we want to tell the story to a, a world, a church that is so desperately needing to see a new model of ministry. When I realize the things that I've been involved in and, and get to do right now, Dan made the joke last week when he said he offered me the position to be able to come and really make a difference with my life. And today I, I see that I get to share with Venture Church, don't do that, I did that and this is what happened. <laughs> do this and this will work well because there's something that we're, we're sharing. But right now, more importantly, is we're building a legacy. We're building something that you can turn to your children and you can say, and to your grandchildren and to their children, I remember what God did in April of 2016. 
I was there when, when Pastor David stood up and said, we need 950,000, and we don't know where it's going to come from. I was there as we got the land. I was there as we put the first shovel in the ground. I was there as the foundations were being laid. I was there as I saw the hotel and the daycare center and the event center go up. I was there as I saw people starting to come to know Jesus. I was there as we went from one service to three services to four services. I was there as we planned. I was there as we touched a city. That's what happened in Nehemiah. As they began to recount the blessings of God, this is what they said in Nehemiah. They said, but in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of clouds still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. See, they recounted what God had done. And Venture Church, you're getting the chance to be able to recount what God had done. You're, you're going to be able to recount the stories and tell your children, and your children are going to repeat the stories to you because you remember what it was to be in a school. You remember what it was when you did not have, and now you have. It was like what God told the children of Israel when they were in slavery uh, in Egypt, he said this in Exodus, and he said, and in the future, he said, your children will ask you, what does all this mean? And then you will tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. My nephews and my daughter have all worked in the hotel. They have cleaned rooms. They have worked in our hotel. My nephew is now older and is now an attorney in, in Vancouver, Washington, and he called me the other day and said, uh, Dusty has asked me to come do his will. He only has just a few short days left to live. Um, Dusty was a homeless man who attended our church, and Dusty, to this day, is still pretty much homeless and doesn't have anything. But he called my nephew because he wanted to make sure that somebody had his Bible and somebody had this that meant something to him. And Dusty has really nothing on this earth. And my nephew said to me, Uncle Eric, I remember the day when you stood up and made a decision, and, and uh, Dusty came into the church, and, and we went down to the swimming pool, and everybody was being baptized, and, and you said, if anybody else wants to be baptized, come on in. We had a 35,000-gallon baptistry in, in Portland, Oregon called the swimming pool, <laughs> and Dusty took off his shirt and shoes and walked in to be baptized. At Thanksgiving and Christmas, we sit around the table, and you know what we talk about? We talk about the lives of the people that were touched in the hotel. We talk about the ministry and our kids recount the stories of the ministry. We recount the, the story of prostitutes standing up in the middle of church and asking questions. We recount the story of people being baptized in the swimming pool. We recount the story of working together in the coffee shop and cleaning rooms. We recount the story of what God did. And God isn't done writing your story. And God isn't done writing my story. And I stand before you as a pastor to say this is a challenge. Let's give it all. When I die, I'm going empty. I don't want to die with another sermon left inside me to preach. I don't want to die inside me with another book left to be written. I don't want to die inside of me with another hotel to be built or another sustainable project. When I die, I want to die empty. When I stand before the Lord, He can say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Venture. That is our journey together. God bless you. Most of you know me um, pretty well. Uh, I don't know how to do this other than just to say, will you please, like please, just go all in with us. Um, you know, we're, next week is our commitment Sunday. Next week, I'm asking you to bring a financial gift. Um, and then also bring a commitment card that says this is what I'm willing to give to this uh, for the next 36 months. Um, we, you know, the, the, the price of the land is 
$925,000 plus about $17,000 more we have to put in escrow for the town because they really want us to take down that water tower. And if we don't, they're going to take it down for us with our $17,000. So it, it comes to a total price tag of, do the math there, $942,000. And, um, you know, that, I mean, I, <laughs> I've never asked anybody for $942,000 before. Um, I, I don't know how to do this. And I, I'm not that, you know, brilliant of a leader to say, hey, we're going to, you know, turn cranks, bells, whistles, whatever. It's just, you know, straightforward. We need to go all in. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to have a conversation with the Lord this week, to be faithful to that conversation, to ask the Lord, God, honestly, like no holds barred. What would you have me do to be a part of this project? What would it look like for me to be all in with you in this partnership and in this project? And then I want you to, to, to write a check that's a response to that conversation. And I want you to write a commitment on a card that's a response to that conversation. Um, I've asked several leadership families in this church, about 30 families, to do that already. And I told you last week, I'll say it again, i blown away um, of 30 families who have, have sought the Lord, who have listened, and who have responded to that conversation. And right now, we have total commitments of $640,000. Okay, so yeah, yeah, you can whistle on that one, All right? But, but here's the deal, it's like... Um, like, we still got a long way to go, but, but even, like, I'm not at the point of that at this point. I'm at the point of don't miss out, okay? Just don't miss out. I mean, we were driving home yesterday from a um, soccer game and a movie, and I had, uh, how many of my kids? I had five of my kids with me, and I was like, guys, we're just going to pull in this driveway here on the property. If you don't know, it's near Bojangles over here on Rocky River, and um, we're just going to pray, and we got out of the car, and we circled up, and, and uh, just each of my kids praying, um, because I don't want them to miss it, I don't want them to miss it, I mean, I know the stories, because, you know, six years ago, we felt like God's leading us to adopt, I have no business financially adopting. And one of the very first things that God did in this process was send us a check for $20,000 for somebody who we had never met. And a friend of mine knew them, told them our story. He wrote us a check, sent it. The friend said, hey, be at your mailbox. I was like, send it to the post office box. And my whole family went to that post office box. We opened up the check right there in the post office. We said, this is the Lord's faithfulness. Like this, when you say yes to the Lord, this is how he provides. And those are the things that are defining moments in my kids' lives. Those are the things that they said, wow, I have not missed out. I have seen it. I have seen it. Don't miss out. Just don't miss out. Like, you can just waste this week. Or you can carve it out and say, Lord, what, what is it that you want me to do? I'm asking you to have a conversation with God, and I'm asking you to respond. Your barriers to response are usually fear. You're just afraid of what that might do. You're afraid of the sacrifice. That might, I'm asking you to actually put yourself in a risky situation because you will be more worldly secure if you hold on to your money. But I'm asking you to go all in and say, hey, let's do this. And let's see how the Lord's faithfulness works out in our lives as we trust him, as we move forward with him. And, and we'll just, we'll be in awe. We really will. And we'll be telling these stories. Another story is, as I was out there greeting people on their way in, somebody said, they, like, they looked a little, a little stressed. It's like, you guys okay? It's like, yeah, like, we just don't know where we're going to live. I was like, what do you mean? Well, 
we sold our house in seven hours. And our new house that we're building is not going to be ready for, you know, months. Like, oh, well, I mean, happy for you. Sad. <laughs> like, I didn't know what to say. And then I was like, well, hold on, where, where, are, you, where are you moving to? He's like, well, we're moving to Mount Holly. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm usually not happy about people moving further away from the church. We always help people move closer. If you're moving further away, you're on your own, all right? It's just how our love goes, limits, you know. Um, they say, no, 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 we've already measured out. 485, boom, like, we've already measured out to the new property. We're in, we're not going anywhere. I'm like, you know, like, I just, like, it was God saying, hey, the, like, I know that this is going to open us up to the whole city. You know, I know we're only four miles away from that property, but if you don't live around here, that's a long four miles. You know, it really is. But when you say, hey, we're, you know, a quarter mile off of 485 at exit 36, all of a sudden, it doesn't really matter where you're at on the loop. You know where that's it. And I'm like, you know, we are, we are stepping in to a future that I believe God has planned for us, that I'm trusting it with all my heart. And now is that moment. And so be faithful with this week. Yesterday we had a day of prayer. And we had different prayer stations. And I don't even know who put all that together. Um, but, but it was amazing. And I just got to sit in and experience and just pray for this thing for an hour. And um, I took pictures of all that stuff. And uh, I sent them to, uh, to Eric and to Dan so that they could just be in prayer. And we're going to actually send out each day this week through email um, one of those prayer stations each day so that you can kind of just read over it real quick and, and, and spend some time in prayer. As you invest an hour or so fasting with God and say, God, what would you have me do? Because this is it. Um, I've left our team uh, we close on, our close dates are April 29th, so I've given them like 12 days, and saying, April 17th, we'll see what we have. April 29th, we go to close, and, um, and those are really important dates, uh, and so here we go, together, I hope. Let's just link arms, seek the Lord with all our heart, and let's see what he does. All right, will you pray with me? God, I uh, stand before you excited. I stand before you uh, not presuming anything about the future. Living right here in this moment, in this present, with all our hopes and all our fears. God, and, and, and just filled with the hope of what, 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 what you could do. What could be, what should be, if we trust you and follow you. I pray, Father, that your spirit would be um, would be clear in each and every heart, each and every life. I know that the journeys that all of us have with you here are at so different points and, and, and come from all different angles, Lord, and that you uh, are faithful to meet us exactly where we're at. And I ask, Father, that, that you would speak clearly to each couple who's trying to decide together what, what does it look like for us to go all in for each uh, single person, for each high school student, for each college student, for, for every person, God, here that just says, what does it look like, God, for me to, to join you in your work? And God, that you would help us to be faithful. I pray that you would uh, push back the enemy and push back the fears, push back the fear of sacrifice and the fear of insecurity. I pray, Father, that, that you would drown out the noise of the world and the um, the things that it offers us and the things that it wants us to, to invest in that just really have no lasting impact. And I pray, Father, that you'd carve out a highway into our hearts. And, Father, that um, we would just step onto that and we would, we would listen closely, we'd follow closely, we'd trust you every step of the way. God, I'm so grateful for the leadership of this place, so grateful for their commitments up to this point, the encouragement of just knowing um, how you're working in each of their hearts and, and just listening to their stories and their journeys, God, has just filled me with so much hope for the future. I pray, Father, that you would not let any of us miss it. We love you, God. We're all in with you. We know it's going to cost us everything. 
And we trust and know that it's going to be worth it because of your promises, because of your faithfulness to your people. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.